Bismillah walhamdulillah wa salatu wassalam ala rasulillah wa ala alu sahbihi wa lah amma ba'd Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh Everybody's doing good? Alhamdulillah So today inshallah we're continuing with Surah Zilzal or Surah Zalzala Two different ways of, uh, of uh, talking about this uh, surah two, two different ways of naming it uh, There are eight ayat in this surah it's Surah number 99 in the Mus'haf And uh, it's a Madani surah it's interesting, in terms of the cause of revelation, there are some narrations that describe that when the Sahaba came across this ayah in Surah Insan, verse number 8, that says, Allah says that they give food in spite of love for it, as in they, they're giving of their wealth in spite of, Allah is describing the believers, saying that they, they give of the, the food that they themselves love, or they themselves, you know, uh, uh, covet, but in spite of that, they still give it to who? The needy and the orphan and the captive. So it's describing basically doing something really great. You know, feeding an orphan, that's, an, that's a great deed. Or somebody who is in desperate need, or somebody who is a captive. You know, these are really monumental, fantastic, big deeds that these people would do. And so some of the Sahaba, when they would hear these ayat, they would say, you know, if these are the deeds that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves, then, you know, what's the point of doing like something small here and there? They basically had this kind of feeling like, well then, what can I do? I, I, can't, I can't do something so great. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in response to this uh, revealed these ayat in Surah Zilzal basically by the end of it describing that every little good thing and every little bad thing you will see on Judgment Day. So that's kind of the, uh, the, the idea there. Wallahu ta'ala a'lam bis sawab. Also, you can break it down into three categories or two categories depending on how you want to break down the surah. You could say ayat 1 to 3 are talking about uh, the chaos of Judgment Day. And then 4 and 5 are talking about how the earth will report whatever Allah inspires it to, do, to say. And then six, seven, and eight is dividing of mankind based on their good or their bad. So you can look at it from those three different perspectives. Or you can look at it in two sections, which is one dealing with earth, which is ayat number one, two, three, four, and five. All those first five ayat talk ha have some mention of earth within it and the state of earth on that day. And then six, seven, and eight talk about mankind. And so it's like this, 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 this contrasting these two different sections. Wallahu ta'ala Adam. Now, what in terms of uh, the correlation with the surah previously, the surah before it was Surah al bayyina And Surah Bayyina talked about our final destination, either heaven or hell. And this surah is describing how we'll get there, as in the scenes coming up to that, building up towards that. So let's get right into it. Bismillah, alhamdulillah. Wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulullah. It's a'udhu uh, 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 billahi minash shaytanir rajim. Bismillahir rahmanir rahim. Iza zulzilat al ardu zilzalaha. Allah says, Iza. So there's two words in Arabic. Idh means when, and Iza means when. But the thing is, in English, when you say when, you can be talking about the future or the past, right? There's no differentiating. When I went to the store, it was closed. When I'll go tomorrow, hopefully it'll be open, right? The first sentence was past, the second sentence was uh, uh, future, and there's no differentiating between the word when. In Arabic, it's not the same. Idh is when for the past tense, idha is when for the future tense. And so you have these differences here. Uh, that's generally the case. So, إِذَا زُلْزِلَتِ And the verb zil, uh, uh, زُلْزِلَتِ here is past tense. And you wonder, well, if it's talking about a future event, why is it talking about it in the past? And the reason is, when Allah talks about future events in the past tense, it's as if it is such a guarantee, it's a done deal. Even us, when somebody tells us a task to be done, can you please, get the, can you please accomplish such and such a thing? You say, done. Done, you're, you're talking about it in the past tense, but you mean that's going to be done. Right? But you're, you're speaking about it with such certainty. So, إِذَا, when, in the future, زُلْزِلَتِ الْأَرْضُ زِلْزَالَهَا Now, what you would expect, well, first and foremost, the word زَلْزَلَ is an interesting word. It has repetition in it, similar to the word waswasa. right? So, waswasa is when shaitan whispers over and over and over again. There's, there's repetition in the word, and there's a repetition in terms of the meaning as well. That it's something that's constantly happening, that shaitan is always whispering to human beings. Zal, the, the, uh, the uh, I guess you could say the root of the root, is zal. Zalla means to slip. So, zalzala is when people are slipping over and over and over again because the shaking won't stop. It just keeps on shaking and keeps on shaking. That's, that's the implication here. Ida zulzilat, when the earth is shaken with, you would expect Allah would say zilzalan. Zilzalan would be called, if you guys aren't familiar, I apologize, but let me just go through it so you hear these terms, inshallah, it'll inspire you to learn more uh, Arabic grammar, inshallah. Zilzalan would be the maf'ul mutlaq, which is basically when you repeat the root of the word, but in its mustar, in its infinitive form. And the idea is to give it some sort of weight. Like if I say, uh, I hit him with such a hit. 
I hit him with the hit that you couldn't even imagine. Wow, it was like a knockout blow, you know? Darabtuhu means I hit him. Darban, like a, a, a hit, like a, an incredible hit. So you would expect it to say, إِذَا زُلْزِلَتِ الْأَرْضُ زِلْزَالًا When the earth shakes, it's mighty shake. Or, or a, a mighty shake, or a, a great shaking. But instead, it's a rough translation of course. But instead what we find is زِلْزَالَهَا It's shaking. Which is interesting because it can imply a few things. One, that when it shakes, it shakes it's, or it is, it is convulsing or has an earthquake with its most unique or most epic convulsion. It's most epic shaking. That's one interpretation. Another one is when it shakes, the shaking that it was made for. As in this earth was designed in such a way that it has an expiration date. And that, that expiration date is on, its, is on its way. It was designed for this one big blowout, if you will. Because obviously we know that when an earthquake happens, it happens in one region. It doesn't happen everywhere. This is going to be unique. It's going to be the whole earth is going to be shaking all at once. So it's going to be something that you've never experienced before. It's going to be very unique. And uh, it's going to be also the third interpretation that when the earth shakes, it's final shaking. It's, 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 last, it's last go, if you will. So this, these are different ways to look at it. Wallahu ta'ala alam. Um, of course, inshallah, the believers will be protected on that day because Allah knows, uh, I mean, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protects the believers. But it's also, it's also interesting here. There's something that uh, we need to keep in mind. That when it comes to this surah, there's two different opinions. That one is that, so imagine that people are living their normal lives and then judgment day starts to happen, right? And that, that all these events, you know, the, the universe starts falling apart and the earth starts shaking and so all these different things take place, right? It's, very, it's described in various places in the Qur'an. But one idea is that this is when, this, what, what Allah is describing here is at the beginning of that judgment day and then everyone's going to die. Another interpretation is that everybody's dead and then the horn is blown you know, once to kill everyone and then the horn is blown a second time and everybody is resurrected and when they are resurrected, that's what this is describing. So the second interpretation is what? When the earth shakes its violent shaking is describing actually when everybody's already dead and now they start to become revived and now they're on this giant plane. The earth has been flattened out in such a way where there's no ups and downs, but it's, it's, uh, it, it, there's still this chaos taking place. And this is the second opinion, and I think it's actually, there's more uh, strength to this opinion, and you'll see why as, as we go on, inshallah, why it seems that this is actually talking about the mahshar, the, the resurrection, that this stage that everybody is on, they're all being uh, 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 woken up, they're all rising from their, uh, uh, from their death, and now they're on this plane that is quite chaotic and shaking and convulsing in a way that they, they've never seen before. And the reason why here, we'll see why. Verse number two, أَخْرَجَ is to expel. And the earth, أَخْرَجَ الْأَرْضِ And the earth expels أَثْقَالَهَا It's thiql. Thiql, the plural, thiql means something that is weighty, something that has weight. It could refer to uh, furniture, it could refer to things, your, your, your luggage, things that you carry. But thiql basically, it comes from thaqula, uh, to be heavy. Thaqil means something that is heavy, right? And so أَثْقَال, it's burdens the things that it was holding within, the things that it had uh, within it. So basically the earth is now, if you will, vomiting up. It is spewing out whatever was within it. So this has a few interpretations, three of them uh, particularly. One of them is that the earth will spew up its treasures. And this is a reason, another reason why I think it makes more sense that this is talking about after resurrection. Because there's a hadith, the Prophet says in Sahih Muslim, that the earth will vomit up Long pieces of like, like columns of gold and silver and the murderer will come and say, is this what I committed murder for? And then the one who broke his family ties will come and he will look at this, this gold and the silver or these rubies, these treasures all pouring out of the earth and he will say, is this what I broke my family, family ties for? And then the thief will come and say, is this what I got my hand cut for? And one after the other, people will look at these things and they'll have no value for it. And they will leave it and uh, will not take anything out from it. So this, this hadith in Sahih Muslim is describing this scene in such a way like the people don't care. And to me, I would think that if this is near the end of time, where people are not sure if this is going to keep happening or if they're going to die or they don't know what's going to happen, maybe people would still be covetous. But if they've already died and they've already been, now they're resurrected and they know that the, the judgment is coming, then when they see gold and silver and so forth, they're going to be like, what am I going to do? What am I going to do with this? Gonna gather it and start a shop? There's no, there's not, I can't do nothing with this. So obviously, 
uh, uh, I shouldn't say obviously, it seems to be, from, from my perspective, Allah Ta'ala Alam, it seems the stronger opinion is that this is after people have been resurrected, the earth is shaking, it's vomiting out all these different uh, precious materials, but people do not care for it. That's one opinion. The second opinion is that the, it's talking about the earth's information. Uh, when the earth discharges its burdens, it's talking about all the things that it was holding back, all the things that it knew, all the secrets that it kept, that it witnessed and that it didn't have the opportunity to say, now it starts to say it all. I'm going to get more into this when we talk about ayat number 4 and 5 in just a moment because those ayat seem to really specify this perspective. So I'm going to save that for then. The third opinion is that the thing that is heavy is us. Because Allah describes us as something heavy when Allah in Surah 55, Surah uh, Rahman, Allah mentions in verse 31, سَنَفْرُغُ لَكُمْ أَيُّهَا الثَّقَلَانِ uh, uh, we will uh, attend to you, O thaqalan, O two weighty things, O two prominent things, heavy things. So Allah refers to the human beings and the jinn as things that are thaqil, thaqalan, two heavy things. So if Allah says it's going to expel athqalaha, its burdens, one interpretation is what? The dead bodies. And this again goes with the concept that we've all died and now the earth starts to shake and spew out all these different bodies and human beings start to come out of it. And they don't quite know what to do uh, uh, when they are on this plane. They are in confusion. And the proof of that is the next verse. وَقَالَ الْإِنسَانُ مَا لَهَا The human being starts to say, what is this? What's with this? مَا لَهَا What's with it? What's with this earth? So this could refer to the fact that the earth won't stop shaking. This could refer to the fact that they were resurrected. This could refer, back to, uh, refer to the fact that the earth is now speaking or keeps shooting out its treasures. Whatever the case is, the human being might be wondering, why am I alive? So all of these indicate that the human being is in pure confusion. Malaha, what is with this? What is going on? What is with this earth and what is, what is this scene? It's also interesting that Allah used the word insan. This has two implications. One implication is that it comes from nasiya, which means to forget because a human being is forgetful. So Allah and, uh, has sent messengers that reminded human beings what's going to happen, but yet they forgot. So they're saying, what's happening today? Why? Because they forgot. That's why Allah calls them insan. Another implication is Allah did not use the word nas. Nas is like people when they're together, like all of mankind collectively. But they are not collective, because as we know, everybody's going to be running from one another. On that day, the, the, a man will be running from his mother, from his father, from his, from his brother, from his children. He'll be running in every direction. So Allah is speaking to you in a solitary way. So each individual person, it's not like they're collectively, they got together, formed the United Nations and said, we don't understand what is happening today. It's not like that. On that day, they're resurrected, they're scattered about, and they're wondering, what is happening? What's going on? So that is the scene. It also tells us that this, this event is something that human beings will not be able to predict. You know how we try to predict the weather, we try to figure out you know, what's happening, happening scientifically, try to predict where uh, different fault lines are, where different earthquakes will take place and so forth. The human being will have zero capacity pr to predict th this incredible event. And, and the proof is that Allah says, وَقَالَ الْإِنسَانُ مَا لَهَا They'll be saying to themselves, what is going on here? So, and it's also interesting that Wallahu ta'ala alam, but perhaps the only people that will know what was happening, what, what is happening is the believers. And there's an indication of that in Surah uh, Yasin where Allah subhanahu wa says, قَالُوا يَا وَيْلَنَا مَنْ بَعَثَ مَنْ بَعَثَنَا مِنْ, من مَرْقَدِنَا هَذَا uh, هَذَا مَا وَعَدَ الرَّحْمَانِ وَصَدَقَ الْمُرْسَلُونَ That they will say, the disbelievers will say, woe to us, who has raised us up from, this, from our sleeping place? Who has raised us up? They're going to be running around saying, why are we awake? Why are we resurrected? And then the reply will come, and Allah doesn't say who will give the reply. Maybe it's the angels, but maybe it's the believers. And the, it's possible that the believers will respond and say, this is what Ar-Rahman, the most merciful, has promised, and the messengers told the truth. وَصَدَقَ the, الْمُرْسَلُونَ the, the messengers were true. As in, only the believers will know exactly what's taking place. Wallah Adam, this is one opinion. Ayah number four, يَوْمَ إِذِنْ تُحَدِّثُ أَخْبَارَهَا يَوْمَ إِذِنْ, on that day, تُحَدِّثُ, the earth will uh, report أَخْبَارَهَا It's news. So this is interesting because we find that, well first of all, akhbar is different than naba. Uh, khabar is different than naba. Naba is a, uh, a news about the future. You know, عَمَّ يَتَسَاءَلُونَ عَنِ النَّبَأِ الْعَظِيمِ Allah mentions when they ask each other about this future events taking place. But khabar is news of the past. So the earth is going to be talking about everything that it witnessed in the past. Everything that took place on the earth uh, prior. The question is, it will be speaking to who? Two opinions. Because Allah says that on that day, the, the earth will be reporting its news, but reporting to who? One opinion is that the human beings themselves. So imagine this scene. Human beings are running around 
and they're freaking out saying, what's wrong with it? What's happening? Because they can't really understand what's taking place because their minds haven't grasped that the noise that the earth is making is actually clear words. When they start paying attention, they realize the earth is speaking directly to me and saying, you were guilty of this. And the earth is speaking to that one. You were guilty of this. And all of the news is coming out. And because the human's so unused to something like this, they're screaming, Malaha, what's with it? Why does it keep you know, relaying information? Why does it keep speaking? Why is this earth talking? So they're freaking out. They don't know what's taking place. And when they, when they start to pay more attention, they realize that all of this sound and noise, it's actually the earth speaking to each individual, telling them what they used to do on the earth. And this is, a, and this is something that we should take account of and recognize that the earth is taking witness of what we do. Every last atom, every last molecule, everything is a shahid. Everything is a witness to what is taking place and it will all speak on that day. And you have to remember that all of the earth and all of the, everything is a Muslim. Everything submits to Allah, right? Everything submits to the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it's, it seems to be the case that the earth is actually quite upset with all of the sin that takes place. And that's the second opinion. That who is it speaking to? It's complaining to Allah. Because it was in submission to Allah, always humbly just remaining quiet. And now that it has been given this opportunity to, 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 to speak, it is now complaining of all the filth and evil that it has witnessed that the human beings were taking part in. Whether it be polluting this planet, or whether it be treating each other terribly, or whether it be abusing themselves, whatever the case is, the earth is now upset, and it's relating all this news back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Messenger of Allah, this is a hadith found in Tirmidhi. Uh, Tirmidhi, Al-Baghawi, and Al-Albani all consider it Hassan Gharib, and uh, it's also uh, found in Sahih ibn Hibban. There's a hadith which says that the Prophet ﷺ recited this, this ayah, يَوْمَ إِذِنْ تُحَدِثُ أَخْبَارَهَا And then he asked, he said, Do you know what, what, what what's its information is? And they said, Allah and His Messenger know best. And then the Prophet ﷺ says, Indeed, its information is that it will testify against every servant, male and female, and it will say that he did such and such on such and such a day, and so on and so forth. They'll say, you did this and you did this. It will testify against the uh, different slaves of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and that is its akhbar, akhbaraha. That is its news. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, save us from having the earth complain about us. Instead, it should praise us, hopefully, that we prayed salah on it. It will testify that, oh, he made sajd in this place. He read Quran in that place. We ask Allah to keep us of those who are safe. Ameen, ya Rabbil Alameen. Bi'anna rabbaka aw halaha. It will report what? Bi'anna whatever rabbaka, your Lord, aw halaha. This is interesting. The word rabbaka, the only time Allah has mentioned this whole surah is here in the middle of the surah, where Allah is mentioned as rabb. And the only time that the Prophet ﷺ is mentioned, rabbaka. Your Lord, O Messenger ﷺ. The Prophet ﷺ is mentioned in this surah, which goes to show that the Prophet ﷺ has a special place on this day, and that Allah is speaking to his messenger, relaying to him this information, and painting a scene for him, and he is given prominence. Why? Because on that day he will be given prominence. We know that on that day he will be the one who intercedes for mankind, and will uh, uh, beg Allah ﷻ to begin the uh, uh, judgment, so that people can stop being in this chaotic scene. As that hadith, you know the famous hadith, where they, uh, mankind, they try to talk to Adam and say, can you intercede before Allah and, and get us out of this crazy state? You know, if, if we have to start the judgment, okay, so be it. But let's, let's move forward. And then he says, I can't do it. Go to the next person. So, and they keep going from one messenger to the next. I'm not giving the full uh, justice to the hadith, but you can look it up inshallah ta'ala. And finally, they end up going to the Prophet and he's the one who does a special type of uh, dua. Wallahu ta'ala alam. Um, also interesting, that Allah says, rabbaka It will report whatever your Lord has inspired it to. Awha, to inspire, laha, whatever it has inspired to the earth to say, it will speak. And this obviously uh, goes back to the idea that on Judgment Day, everything will have the ability to speak, whatever Allah gives uh, the, uh, the ability to speak. So for instance, for example, Allah says, وَقَالُوا لِجُلُودِهِمْ لِمَا شَهِدْتُمْ عَلَيْنَا They will say to their skin, why have you testified against us? قَالُوا أَنْتَقَنَ اللَّهَ الَّذِي أَنْتَقَ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ وَهُوَ خَلَقَكُمْ أَوَّلَ مَرَّةٍ وَإِلَيْهِ تُرْجَعُونَ That the, why have you testified? So you're going to be looking at your own body. Not, maybe, hopefully not us, may Allah protect us. But the disbeliever or the criminal will be looking at his own body saying, why are you testifying when it's us that are going to be thrown into the fire? And then uh, they will respond, the skin will, and the bodies will respond and say what? We were made to speak by Allah who has made everything to speak. The, the idea of communication, this is a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so whether it be the earth or whether it be your skin, Allah will give it this uh, miraculous ability to communicate. That day, people will be uh, depart, separated into categories. They will be, uh, mankind will be driving towards ashtatan. Groups, 
لي so that يرو, they will be shown أعمالهم, they will be shown their deeds. So this is interesting. In terms of being separated into groups, there's two opinions. One is that they will be separated into groups, as in everybody will be separated into the groups according to their deeds. Now this is a very, uh, this has evidence, Allah says in Surah Naba, uh, The day, the, the day uh, that the horn is blown, and you will come forth in multitudes, in different groups. So this is one evidence for it. So the idea is what? That people will come in groups, perhaps believers versus disbelievers. Perhaps, as we know, there are different abwab, there are different doors to Jannah. So people being put into groups, this, these people go into the bab of salah. These people go into the door of uh, uh, fasting, the uh, rayan, right? People go into the, the, the door of sadaqah. Whatever thing you did as prominent, whatever deeds that you did that stood out, you'll be rewarded accordingly, wallahu ta'ala alam. And so that's one opinion. And the scary thing about that opinion is this. Anytime you do a deed, think about the people that you're with. This is an important thing to keep in mind. So let's say somebody tells a lie. But then they think to themselves, wait a second, am I now considered part of the liars? Am I now with th that group of people? And then when they start thinking about all the people that they've known in their lives that have been liars, they think to themselves, I don't want to be with that group. You know, I know I've heard of stories where people, let's say, they're living their jahili lifestyle, they're living a very you know, sinful lifestyle. Let's say they're at a club. And then they have a moment of reflection, a moment of realization. They look around and they say to themselves, it, it, what if I died here? You know, is this where I want, is this, is this where my journey ends? Is this where my life concludes? I mean, alhamdulillah, I think that us being in the masjid right now, if a meteor just destroyed this whole city, we would say, well, at least, at least, I, was, at least I was in the masjid. That's not so bad. Alhamdulillah, that's a good place to go. At least I was in good company. You know, so you always want to think about who are you hanging around and what deeds are you doing that puts you in which categories, amongst which people. These are the things that you want to think about in life uh, regularly about, oh, you know, who am I going to be with? Uh, inshallah ta'ala. And who do I want to be judged with? Who do I want to be resurrected with? And who do I want to go to the same destination with? As in either paradise or hellfire. These are things that we all want to, t uh, uh, to think about inshallah ta'ala. And the second opinion is that on that day we'll be alone. And wallah maybe both opinions are correct. That at first everybody is alone and everybody is judged before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone and then they're put into categories and then those categories get put into either paradise or hellfire. Wallah alam, the whole scene can be put together uh, you know, uh, with different perspectives. And, but the evidence is for the idea that we are separated. Allah says, وَيَوْمَ تَقُومُ السَّاعَةُ يَوْمَ إِذِنْ يَتَفَرَّقُونَ That day when the hour takes place, that day they will become separated. وَكُلُّهُمْ آتِيهِ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ فَرْدَى Everybody will come uh, alone on uh, Judgment Day. وَلَقَدَ جِئْتُمُونَ فُرَادَى كَمَا خَلَقَنَاكُمْ أَوَّلَ مَرَّةِ Allah says that, and it will be said to them, you have certainly come to us alone as we created you the first time. So there are many different evidences for these positions. لِيُرَوْ So that they will, be, they will be shown أَعْمَالَهُمْ They will be shown their deeds. This is really fascinating. Because it can be understood in three different ways. They will be shown their deeds as in, we can all imagine like a TV screen, well, well I don't how it's going to be shown, but I'm sure we can imagine. You're shown your deeds like you're shown your whole life. Or in your book of deeds, everything's written down. That's the most straightforward way. Another interpretation is, you will see the outcome of what you did in dunya. As in, you are shown your deeds. So for example, you said something rude, right? But you didn't know that that rude thing really had an effect on a person. That person went home that night, maybe cried that night. That person was then, because they were so frustrated, they're rude to somebody else. Whatever the case is, right? So you don't know the domino effect that took place because of a certain deed. So on that day, you'll be shown your deeds, as in you'll be given the ability to understand fully what exactly you did and the effects that it, that it had. So, so it's not just a question of being shown the deed, because maybe you know, you know what you did. But you don't know the domino effect. So you'll be shown the whole perspective. And then the, other perspe the, the third uh, way of looking at this is that you'll, sh you'll be shown the outcome. As in you'll be shown your deeds and where they will lead you. As in you'll be able to see hellfire. You'll be able to see paradise. You'll be able to see those deeds, why they were good, why they were bad, understand them fully, and then where they uh, uh, lead to. Wallahu ta'ala alam bisawab. فَمَنْ يَعْمَلْ مِثْقَالَ ذَرَةٍ خَيْرًا يَرَهُ وَمَنْ يَعْمَلْ مِثْقَالَ ذَرَةٍ شَرًا يَرَهُ so whoever does an atom's weight, mithqala, though the weight of dharrah. Dharrah is like the smallest possible, you know, the smallest possible um, unit of measure, you know. So that's why it's usually translated as uh, an atom's weight. Uh, whoever does even an atom's weight of good, yarahu, he will see it. And whoever does an atom's weight of evil, he will see it. So it's interesting is that it starts with fa. 
يعمل, so it's a concluding remark. So, as in after all these different ayat, after these first six ayat, the seventh ayah is now concluding with fa. So therefore, after this whole chaotic scene, and after you're all put into, uh, the, the earth starts in giving all this different news, and because of that news and information, now you're all put into different categories. Therefore, you will either see every last atom weight of good and every last atom weight of evil. This, this is the concluding remark. It's, it's scary to think that Allah says, مِثْقَالَ uh, ذَرَّ you don't even think that it has a weight. Something so small, so tiny, you don't even consider it to have a weight. And that's exactly the problem. That when it comes to good deeds and sins, sometimes we do something good and we think, oh, that's nothing. You should never think that. The Prophet says, لا تحقيرن من المعروف شيئا ولو أن تلقى أخاك بوجه تلق Don't consider anything insignificant. Never consider anything insignificant of good. Any little bit of ma'roof, any little bit of good that you do, never consider it insignificant, even if it is smiling in the face of your brother. Now, obviously, most of us, when we see somebody and we naturally smile, it is, you, rarely do you even think about it. You just say, you just smile, hey, Sango, how are you doing? You're not thinking to yourself, oh, I smiled, that's a good deed. You, you, because we naturally think that, oh, it's nothing, it's not nothing. Allah and His Messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, are telling us it's not nothing, it's really significant. Never belittle these little things. Why? Because, inshallah, the intention is good. And you don't know the effects that it has. The intention is for Allah, therefore that makes it good. The moment you think, oh Allah, I'm doing this for your sake, even though it's small, just that intention makes it bigger. And the fact that that person now, you know, when you smile at somebody, they feel good about themselves. The fact that you've given somebody a good feeling. Don't belittle that. You've made somebody feel good about themselves, so uh, don't, don't, don't uh, belittle such a thing. So, yes. Um, it's also interesting that this surah, it starts with a whole earth shaking, something so big, and then it transitions all the way to something so small as even an atom's weight. So it's so interesting how it goes from the biggest to, you know, from the, from the, like, the thing that we consider the biggest, like we're on planet Earth, such a big, con all this is taking place, it's so chaotic, and then everything gets so specific and so clarified, where even the biggest thing shaking is confusing, it goes from the largest and the most confusing, all the way to the smallest and the most clear, as in every little thing that's small is going to be either good or bad, and you will understand it fully. So it's very interesting that in this short surah, you see this big transition from large confusion to very small and precise clarity. Wallahu ta'ala alam. And uh, there's a, this is a beautiful quote that I think is just fantastic. Muhammad ibn Ka'b radiallahu anhu, he says a beautiful quote. فَمَنْ يَعْمَلْ مِثْقَالَ ذَرَةٍ خَيْرًا يَرَى مِنْ كَافِرٍ يَرَى ثَوَابَهُ فِي الدُّنْيَا فِي نَفْسِهِ وَمَالِهِ وَأَهْلِهِ وَوَلَدِهِ حَتَّى يَخْرُجَ مِنَ الدُّنْيَا وَلَيْسَ لَهُ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ خير. Allahu Akbar. See, look at this. And then, and then he continues, but he just flips it. Let me just break it down so I don't uh, make it, so I make it easy, inshallah. When we listen to the surah, we think to ourselves, whoever does an Adam's weight of good is going to see it, that must be referring to the believers. And whoever does an Adam's weight of evil is going to see it, that must be referring to the disbelievers. But then there's an issue. If you look at the previous surah, surah Bayina, uh, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ends, concludes the previous surah with disbelievers and then believers. Right? So why is it that in the next surah it concludes with good and then bad? So one interpretation is no, there is con continuity. The verse that's talking about you will see every good is actually a threat to the disbelievers. And you will see every evil is actually the reward of the believers. And now you think to yourself, no, no, no you're getting it backwards. No, I'm not. The opinion of this of one uh, 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 Muhammad ibn Ka'b uh, anhu, is that no, it's flipped. And I'll to explain why. It's so fascinating. It's so very interesting. The idea is this. The disbeliever will be brought on judgment day. He'll be shown every last good, good deed he ever did, even to the point of the Adam's weight. Every last good you've seen. And then he will be shown whatever good that you did, that's why you got the reward in dunya in your body. That's why you got the reward of dunya in your wealth. You got the reward in dunya for this deed, for this good deed in your family. In your this, and so, and everything's gonna be listed. Remember that time you gave charity? Here was your reward. Remember that time you were kind? Here's your reward. To the point of the Adam's weight. And then after all this, that is explained, it will be said to him, look, you've, for all the good that you've done, you've been rewarded in dunya. You never did it for my sake. You never did it for Allah's sake. You were never sincere to me. In fact, you disbelieved in me. You have nothing to do with me. And now you are 100% justified to go to hell, <laughs> essentially. Which is a very, very scary concept. Because Again, we have to always remember that in the Qur'an, you never find that the disbelievers that are going to hell, they ever say this is unfair. You never find them complaining and saying this is unfair. In fact, you find the opposite in Surah Mulk. Uh, when the 
uh, when the angels are just about to push the disbelievers into hellfire, they give them one last psychological torture before the physical torture. They ask them, Alam yet tikum nadir? Didn't a warner come to you? Just to burn them, you know, just to burn them internally before the externally. قَالُوا بَلَا قَدَ جَاءَنَا نَذِيرٌ فَكَذَّبَنَا وَقُلْ مَا نَزَ اللَّهُ مِنْ شَيْءٍ So what is their response? They say, yes, of course, messengers came to us, but we denied them. فَكَذَّبَنَا وَقُلْ مَا نَزَ اللَّهُ And we said that no, Allah didn't reveal anything. So they completely denied. So they are going to testify right before they get pushed in the fire. Didn't a warner come to you and say, yes, yes, I, did. I was warned, but I didn't pay attention. This is exactly why I'm getting what I deserve. So they never complained. So this, so this is another pushing in that same direction, the idea that what? They'll be shown all their good deeds to the point of an atom's weight, and they will have nothing in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they'll know it. And then the exact opposite is true as well. That the, the, the believer who has gone through many different hardships, he'll be shown. Remember that time you did that sin? Even to the point of an atom's weight. Remember all those little evil things that you did? All those things, that one related to why you got sick. That one related to why your car broke down. That one related to why uh, you got frustrated. Why you're, I don't know, you got stressed out, etc, etc, etc. And now that all of those evil deeds have been punished, now you get to enter in, into paradise completely free of sin. Uh, as, the, as it says in the end of Surah 89, Allah subhanahu wa mentions in Surah uh, Fajr, that it will be told to this pure soul now, this, uh, this longing soul, this soul that it, you know, now has a longing for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the, the tranquil soul. Uh, come back to your Lord, uh, pleased with, who is pleased with you and you are pleased with him. That inshallah ta'ala. So we'll, we'll, we'll go into those ayat later inshallah, but the idea is what? That now you can enter purely and uh, without any sin. Wallahu ta'ala alam. We should remember when it comes to the small, and I'm going to conclude inshallah very soon. When it comes to the small deeds, we should be very, very careful about evil missteps, even when they're small. Why? Because that's how things build. We all know the whole snowball effect, right? Starts with something small, it builds, 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 it keeps growing. This is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala warns us, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, la tattabi'u khutuwat ash-shaytan. Allah says what? Don't follow the footsteps of shaytan. Allah doesn't say don't follow shaytan. Because saying don't follow shaytan is don't follow obvious evil things. Allah says don't follow the footsteps. Why? Because maybe the footsteps aren't so clear. So you have to pay much, much more attention to realize that, oh, maybe this just seems like a tiny little baby step. But it's leading towards evil, therefore they are khutuwat ash-shaytan, the footsteps of shaytan. We should never think of ourselves and our deeds as insignificant. Many people think to themselves, I'm just one person in seven billion. Seven billion, that's such a big number, right? We should recognize, rather, that you as an individual, you know, let's say, a thousand people in your lifetime, right? They say the average person knows, let's say, roughly a thousand people in their lifetime. And those thousand people will know another thousand people, inshallah, roughly. I mean, obviously, it's not exact, but we're saying, generally speaking. So that means that you're one person removed from a million people and two people removed from a billion people. Of course, again, theoretically. The idea is what? When you paint such a picture, the idea that you're trying to demonstrate is that we are not, no man is an island, as the expression goes. No man is an island. We are one node in a very large network. That's how human beings are. So you affect people, those people affect people, so on and so forth. And if you take it to this sort of uh, model, you could, you could theoretically calculate that you could affect billions of people. Wallahu alam, there's only seven, pe seven billion people on the earth. So from that perspective, then you realize, wow, I as an individual have such a big effect if I have an effect on my children, on my community, on my friends, who they affect other people, and who knows, maybe on, on Judgment Day, I'll be shown the effects of what I've done, and maybe it'll be, it'll be way greater than I could ever imagine. Ibn Mas'ud, uh, who has a very beautiful quote, He says that the most comprehensive and decisive verse in the Qur'an are these two verses, That whoever does an Adam's weight of good will see it, and whoever does an Adam's weight of evil will see it. He says, this is the most decisive, clear, most comprehensive. If you understand this, you understand a lot. Also, the Prophet says, إِيَّاكُمْ وَمُحَقَّرَاتِ الذُّنُوبِ فَإِنَّهُنَّ يَجْتَمِعْنَ عَلَى الرَّجُلِ حَتَّى يُهْلِكْنَهُ that beware of belittling sins. Beware of the belittled sins. I should say it that way. It's better translated. Beware of the belittled sins. Because they'll indeed gav gather over a man until it destroys him. You know, as we all know, oh, I'm just taking one puff. Yeah, one puff becomes a pack a day, becomes how many cigarettes over a lifetime, how many millions of dollars. If you calculate, you know, let's say uh, $10 a day, 
and then you put it for a whole person's lifetime, how much money was wasted, how much time was wasted, how much health was wasted, and it gives you cancer and it kills you in the end, and all you did was say, oh, it's just a puff. So we all know that there are so many sins that become addictive, waste so much of your time, it's snowball effect, we should be careful, and inshallah I'll finish with this last poem, which I think is very, very beautiful. It is attributed to Abu Huraira, I don't know the authenticity of that, Wallahu alam, but either way it's a nice poem, so let me just say, خَلِّ الذُّنُوبَ صَغِيرَهَا وَكَبِيرَهَا فَهُوَ التُّقَى وَاصْنَعْ كَمَاشٍ فوق الأرض الشوك يحذر ما يرى لا تحقرن صغيرة إن الجبال من الحصى. So it sounds nice in Arabic, right? It, it rhymes nicely. The hadith, the, 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 this, uh, this little poem, it says, Leave sins small or big, that is taqwa. Be like the one walking on thorny ground, careful of what he sees. Don't belittle a small sin. Indeed, mountains are made of pebbles. So it's just a nice little uh, 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 poem to sort of say, you know, whether it's small or big, that's what having taqwa is. To pay attention to the big or small, as it's like the person who's walking carefully on very thorny area, you don't want to get caught on this or that, you don't want to ruin your clothes, so you're being very, very careful where you walk. And don't belittle even a small thing, because obviously, like I said, a, a, a mountain is made of, of small pebbles. And with that, we close. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us of those who uh, always try to do good deeds no matter how big or small they are. And let's uh, refrain from evil deeds no matter how big or small they are. Ameen ya Rabbil Alameen. Wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam sallam kathira. Wa sallamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh.